to the Data Leadership Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algeman. Data is everywhere in our businesses, and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. Today, I'm joined by Dan Hibble and Ken Frazier. Together, they run Animatics Consulting, which focuses on all things data, project leadership, and business process enablement. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Anthony. So there's a method to the madness, and there's a reason that I asked you to be on this week specifically, and that is I've just come off of three or four weeks of talking to kind of high-level data management thought leaders that that do a lot of the strategic side of data work. And in, in full disclosure, I've done some work with you guys in the past, and one of the things that always stood out um, for me in working with you is that it's not just the strategy element that you take on, but it's that end-to-end transformation and change management that's so important to being successful with data. And so today, I'd like to really focus in on some of those aspects of, of how you help organizations and some of the challenges that we see with companies as they try to become better with data in, in all of what they do. Um, but before that, just why don't we take a couple minutes and talk through a little bit about where Animatics Consulting came from and, and kind of some of your background and, and what your uh, value proposition to the marketplace is. Sounds good. Um, so it, Animatics started um, mid-1999. Um, I had gone independent from the consulting firm that I had worked for, same consulting firm that uh, Ken had worked for a few years prior. He had left a little bit earlier. Um, you know, in the early months of the year, I believe it was March or April, um, we were kind of reintroduced to one another as Ken was looking for what was next for him. Um, and we sat down for lunch and we started talking about, you know, what we wanted to build individually in a consulting firm. Um, and that really quickly evolved in, you know, what made sense for us and why it made sense for us to work together. You know, in a lot of ways, Ken and I uh, are kind of the yin and the yang in that Ken is very much in the data where I don't know a whole lot about the data side of the things. You know, I live more in the project and the program management, the business process um, side of things. So as Ken and I started to sit down and talk about, you know, what a partnership might look like, um, what a company might look like, um, it just made a whole lot of sense of, you know, we could bring a lot to the marketplace together, um, you know, with what I had to offer, with what Ken had to offer, what we as an organization um, would then be able to bring to the market. Right. Um, so in that value proposition, why did you think it would be better to go off? Because as, as an entrepreneur or having been an entrepreneur myself, you know, that's not an easy path per se. Why did you say, you know what, we should go and do our own thing? What, what was it? What was that catalyst that made you want to go into business for yourself as opposed to maybe growing a practice under you know, the umbrella at a, at a much larger consulting firm? Yeah, so I would say I think we just wanted to do it um, kind of our own way or, or maybe a little bit different way. Um, you know, there, there's extremes and part of it's in the name too. Um, you know, animatics is a combination of analytics and, and pragmatism and that kind of really embodies uh, what we what we try and achieve. There's, you know, some of these projects not, not knocking one way or the other, but where, you know, some, some folks will come in and, Try to go to one extreme and it's all very theoretical and high level and then it comes to implementation time and it doesn't necessarily work um because you have to make some concessions from the you know the by the book sort of approach uh on the other extreme there could be situations where things are just kind of blindly getting hacked together and maybe wrong or uh, inaccurate or not serving the business the way they need to be so what we're trying to do is kind of toe that line right in the middle with a very client centric approach collaborative approach, if you will, and saying, well, you know, the ideal state is to do it this way, probably shouldn't do it this way. So like, let's try and figure out that middle ground where we can practically um, tackle some of the business problems we're trying to solve. Right. And, and just going back to what Dan said, uh, that that notion of you guys being, you know, the yin and yang or, or two sides of the same coin and, and focusing in different areas, I think it gives you um, you know, a, a more well-rounded perspective than simply approaching it from, you know, the, the data side of, of the house, because there's, there's so much more that goes on. And, and can, you, can you tell us a, a story maybe or an example of where 
you guys were able to approach a problem for a client in a way that um, you know, really brought forward the best of both of your skill sets? Yeah, I'll start off and Dan, you can, you can chime in. I mean, I feel like very recently, there's a great example where, um, you know, we were, we were tackling, tackling what ultimately looked like a data problem at, you know, at the surface, which is, you know, there's inconsistent um, analytics going on for a big um, product management area at a, a large company. Um, and so it's like, well, we just need to make sure that we're consistently, re you know, reporting this stuff out and communicating it to vendors or partners um so you know you look at that you're like okay well we can we can put together a consistent set of dashboards and drill throughs and get you what you need but um that's kind of my world right mm -hmm. uh, where dan comes into play is well let's get the right people in the room let's get some whiteboarding sessions and get them involved we can have open discussions about the different ways that uh people are doing different things and, and the rationale behind it see if we can get them to agree on uh commonality across that you know from the outset and then at the end you know i'm kind of a you know maybe too extreme but i can get myself in a position where like it's done i get it so everyone else must get it but that's not that's not good enough um there's the element of then getting it out in front of people you know broader audiences making sure they understand it they understand the motivations behind it the rationale behind it they understand how to use it um and, and that's the type of stuff that you know not necessarily my wheelhouse but dan's great at kind of leveraging the, his experience in those areas and, and kind of capping off either end of you know what would traditionally be like more of a pure data analysis type project sure yeah it, it, the way that i see it is very much like kevin was saying but in, in the end we're a microcosm of the companies and the clients that we have right um you know they've got their it and they've got their data sides um, but they've also got their business and they need to make that technology, they need to make that data work for them. You know, in the end, the entire project, the entire effort needs to drive value, return on investment. Um, and, you know, I think if it was just me, you know, I'd often oversell, you know, what data can do or what we can do with data. And that way, Ken reigns me in. And on the flip side, you know, as Ken was kind of saying, as he was speaking there, um, you know, I, I kind of keep Ken in check as related to it. You know, the data is now here, you know, make it usable. Well, it's not just about being here. It's about people understanding it, not under, just under, you know, putting it in front of them, but letting them make it usable, um, you know, and easy. You know, how do, we, how do we get data in front of people, get them to understand it, get them to use that data, get that data to drive value. Um, and, you know, we play really nicely in that area. Um, and we, you know, provide those checks and balances along the way. Yeah, one thing that I think you guys do exceptionally well is provide ideas to the client because a lot of the time, you know, the clients will will not necessarily know everything that they want to even do uh, with a particular technology or particular initiative. And there is something to be said for either prototyping or coming up with ideas and bouncing it off of them saying, hey, would this work? Would this be something that you'd find useful? And I think you guys do a very good job of, of kind of tag teaming to help a client understand what that possibility set might be. Because if you if you rely too much on requirements and saying, hey, Mr. Mrs. Client, please tell me what you want to have, that, that kind of cuts off some of the innovation potential that you would otherwise have. And I think you guys do a very good job of, of connecting with folks. Do you have any secrets to that? Like, are there, is there anything that the rest of us don't know of how to really get clients that kind of added level of, of insight about what the, what the possible might be? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I, I think part of it's just the mentality that we bring in. I mean, it's, um, we don't walk in and pretend to know uh, these businesses better than the people that have been there for years, right? Uh, on the other extreme, we're not going in and expecting things to be kind of spoon-fed to us and say, here's the specific requirements you want. It's, again, it's that middle ground that we're really trying to focus on. It's just like, you know, we can kind of see how you're doing this, um, help us understand the business. Um, once we get that kind of baseline level of understanding, we can be a lot more collaborative and say, you know, well, here's how it is. This is what we're seeing in the data. This is what we're hearing from people that work with the data. Have you considered this? Or maybe we can try this. And it's, you know, it's hard in these times, which I'm sure we'll get to. It's so much easier, I feel like, when you're 
in, in a room on a whiteboard. Um, just being able to map these things out and toss ideas around, but you know, we, we figured out how to accommodate. So I feel like um, that that's it, it's in the name. It's the pragmatic. It's the analytics. It's it's, it's kind of why why we partnered up in the first place. It, it comes full circle that we're trying to not be on either one of those extremes and kind of be in that middle ground and really collaborate uh, with the with our clients as opposed to telling them what to do or asking them what they want us to do. Yeah, it, you know, it, it it's it's funny because there's it's not all, you know, um strategy and big picture stuff. There's a, like I think the word I'm looking for is slog. Like data is a slog. It is tough to do this stuff well. And it takes a long time and it's not sexy. It's not exciting some of the time as much as myself and other data management professionals think, "Oh, this is the greatest stuff in the world." It can be really painful to work in a lot of the time to make the progress that you want to make and being able to coach clients through it when they have a bunch of different competing priorities i think that's a a it's a very difficult thing because people have have put data on this pedestal of being important which it is but to be successful at it doesn't come easily and it, it is really a challenge that is a day in and day out kind of challenge um more so than a, a let's set that strategy and we'll be good. Like that's not how that works. Yeah, I think it, it, it's all very true. And uh, you know, just to kind of give kind of kudos, you know, one of the things that Ken does, you know, when he gets into that data, is you know he iterates, you know, really quickly, really rapidly, or or as rapidly as possible, given the data set that we're working with. But being able to show clients things that they haven't seen before, you know, it may not be what they want. Often, it's not the end state. You know. Most of the time, it's not the end state, but to kind of get their wheels turning and letting us, like, as you said, kind of, you know, facilitate those whiteboarding sessions, um, you know, with actual data that can be put in front of them that they haven't seen before or that they haven't seen in this form and fashion before, you know, it, it starts to get really powerful and people start to, you know, see that in the first iteration and then the second iteration and then that excitement starts to build not only on the data side, but on the business side, you know, the art of the possible, what can we do with this? Wow. We haven't seen this before. We haven't, you know, been able to do this type of thing before. So, you know, Ken puts that stuff together and, you know, he'll be the first to tell you, cause he tells me all the time, he goes, you know, this isn't a hardened state, you know, we can't productionalize this. Um, you know, that's going to take some time, but it's also not fair to our clients to say, you need to take on this huge, massive project. Um, and not be sure what you're going to get, right? So if we can start iterating, you know, get in and, you know, for, for we'll, you know, the dip the proverbial toe in the water, both financially and, you know, from a time perspective to get our clients started, to really start to get them, you know, hardening their thoughts and their ideas of really want what they might want from an end state. You know, it also makes, gives us a little bit of, you know, toe in the water to, is this really possible? Is what they want possible from, you know, the current state of their data, their architecture, their, you know, where they're at, you know, as an institution, um, you know, and then we can really start to put, you know, what a project might be, what might the ROI be, you know, all those other things that come from an end. But for me, it really all starts with, you know, what Ken does exceptionally well, and it's iterating through those first couple of sequences to get, you know, people, you know, more aligned with exactly what their vision was, which is ironic because it's their vision, right? So they've got this vision and often, you know, when you have data, it's like, I want this, and this is what you want until it's delivered, and then that's not what it's wanted, right? So, you know, kind of taking these steps along the way is, is so helpful to make sure that, you know, what they get in the end is is really going to be useful to them, and that can, at the data side of this, you know, it does a really wonderful job of it for us. Yeah, there's a couple of things in there that you, that you said that I really like. Like, one of the things is, is, is talking about the vision, and the vision is the client's vision. The, the, the key thing, though, is visions are pretty easy compared to actually executing on that vision because that's where you get grounded in reality and like i don't know um if you guys have had this experience or, or a similar experience but occasionally you'll you'll run into a client so much of what you talked about there was about managing expectations and and being clear and communicating effectively have you ever run into a, a circumstance with a client where they're like you know we really want to do this you know artificial intelligence or some other very grandiose type of of uh, objective and you get under the covers after a couple of days and realize, oh, wait, we, we need to learn how to crawl still before we try to fly. And, and like, how do you when when expectations are so misaligned, what do you do in that kind of circumstance? I mean, 
most of the time. That's the <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I, I know there's some organizations out there that are ready for those fancy words and stuff like that, but I'd say more often than not, um, uh, they're not. You, you get under the hood and you're like, well, how, how could you possibly um, create this awesome algorithm and, you know, in, introduce, you know, some phenomenon of machine learning into the environment when the data behind it is quite honestly just crap, like, or nobody understands it or, you know, doesn't already, you know, suit other questions like what is happening, not like, what should we be doing? Mean, you can't even tell what is happening. Um, so walk into it almost, almost all the time. <laughs> um, but the reality is when we, when we start and we engage with the client, we have that conversation up front, which is like, look, let's, let's, it, it's a whole iterative approach that Dan mentioned earlier, but it, it's, it's also, um, you know, setting expectations up front. It's just like, here's how we're going to work. We need to establish the building blocks first or at least understand the building blocks. And if those building blocks are out there, help us understand them more often than not. There's no documentation around it. That's the slogging that you're talking about earlier. You're reverse engineering stuff to figure out how things work and where things live and all these various definitions. So we, we talk about those likelihoods prior to engaging um, and as we go through the process. And, and I don't know that we would take on a project that doesn't, like there isn't an agreement up front that that is a likely path um, at least from the outset until things are in a good enough state to make it more effective. Right. Right. It, it, and I like that it, it comes back to even some of the origins of, of your company name around that, that pragmatism, because there is something to be said for solving problems and, and making things happen, even if it's, if it's in loose alignment with an overall strategy, or even if there's no strategy, sometimes just doing good work can lead to better outcomes and, and better strategy. It doesn't always have to be this big, heavy, top-down thing. Sometimes you're in a kind of grow it from the bottom, learn what's going on, and and chart that path based on the information that actually presents itself. And I think, you know, combining the two, I think, is, is the goal. But sometimes you, you don't even have the situational awareness to be able to, to, to execute on a broad-based strategy. You have to kind of work with what you've got. Where, where are the building blocks that you have access to and, and how do you build something with those? Yeah, it's, it's, it's where Dan comes in a lot. It's, I can help and say, what, what is possible now based on what I'm seeing and what's out there and what you're telling me? But then it's like, well, we know you want to do all this other stuff. So what, is, what are all the other changes that need to take place? Whether it's you know, business process, uh, system modifications, et cetera, to be able to start capturing the data to make that vision a reality into the future. And that, you know, we, we can try and separate those things and then chip away at them in parallel, you know, start presenting what is possible with the existing set of data and then work um, in a separate thread, you know, I shouldn't say separate, but in a parallel thread um, to, to, get, to get them to their vision over time. Yeah, and I think the only thing I would add to that is it's making sure that there's value along the way. You know, anytime you start talking about vision, like I hear a long-term project, right? I hear, you know, six to 12 months at, at the minimum, you know, we're going to try to to help you achieve your vision, um, you know, but there's baby steps and there's value that can be delivered, you know, in month one, in week two, you know, I mean, as we go along, you know, what, what, what do you have now? What don't you have now? And what can be valuable? Let's get that out there. Let's let people start using it um, because those real world applications of that data really are going to drive, you know, that value proposition of the overall project. And, you know, a lot of times as people start to get their hands on this, you know, their vision changes, right? So, you know, we want to make sure that we are flexible enough um, to change with that vision. But we also want to talk about what do you have and what do you need as it relates to your data, right? I mean, we're not going to jump from, you know, just learning to crawl to predictive analytics, you know, overnight in a, you know, two to three month, you know, span, but we can get stuff out there that can start to inform, you know, your business, how you're going to use this information, how it's going to help you drive your business, um, you know, and then kind of moving that needle down the, down the, um, or moving that ball down the, down the field. Yeah, and, and talking about that that vision, you know, if you use a synonym for vision being the long term, well, the long term only ever gets here as a series of short terms. You know, you you never get to the long term. It's always the short term, and that that aggregation of the short terms eventually gets you 
to that long term. Similarly, with a vision, it's only through executing today that you take another step towards that vision. And you're always going to be looking further ahead than you'll ever actually reach in the immediate term. So it's it's a constantly moving target, but you still have to have uh, those kinds of, of milestones. I'd, I'd yeah. like to change top not change topics so much but but pull out a thread because you guys have been doing this and in, in, in this space for for quite some time and one of the things that i've observed probably over the last five to ten years especially is the unprecedented growth and capability of user facing technologies and, and data tools whether we're talking about things like you know tableau and, and power bi these these kinds of ability for an individual to do things with pretty substantial sets of data and calculations and and you know analytics of, of various sorts um you know is really pretty unprecedented you could do more on a laptop today than you could on a server 20 years ago how has this changed the landscape in the in the organizations that you're working with have have these tools led to better outcomes or have they led to bigger messes and i'm curious from your perspective of, of how have you seen that evolve and what are you doing about it or, or how do you coach organizations that now have much more firepower at their disposal um i'll start <laughs> uh have they led to better outcomes sometimes have they led to bigger messes sometimes? Um, th there's pros and cons, and it depends on how you look at it. I'm not going to get into necessarily tool specifics. You know, mm -hmm. we've touched on a bunch of them, but I, I agree with your sentiment that there's definitely a lot of power out there. You can definitely do on your laptop what you know servers would have struggled to do many years ago, uh, which is awesome, right? But there's pros and cons to that. Um, one, some of these tools, it's not just about having the tool. It's about having someone to, who uses the tool and someone that knows how to actually configure it, I'll call it, mm -hmm. develop in it, whatever terminology you want to use. Uh, and you look at those populations and, you know, a lot of times um, the, the users, there's an adoption element, which Dan will probably talk about a little bit more, and getting a level of comfort with it. I mean, the reality is people love spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are great. They're a great invention, great in the you know, great to introduce into businesses, and I think they've added a lot of value. But you know, now people are used to it and they're comfortable with it, so that's kind of where where they naturally gravitate. Versus a lot of these analytics and BI tools are are intended to have a lot of the data sitting behind the scenes and then aggregating it, summarizing it, and hopefully into meaningful insights. Um, and I think there's just like a, a leap there that's difficult for some of the end users. Um, talking about the people that know the tools well, I think that's definitely a gap out there. Uh, you can talk about a Tableau, a Click, um, a Power BI, whatever you want to talk about, but ultimately you need to have someone that actually understands how to use some of those formulas that exist within the tools to be able to um, publish and present some of this awesome information and aggregate the information the way that people want. Um, and so there's an element of people needing to understand that. And I think that in some ways can hamstring organizations in that um, there's just not enough people that understand them at a deep enough level versus someone who understands how to do stuff in spreadsheets um, to make them as powerful as they could be. Uh, at the same time, now with these tools and with um, many companies opening up access to some of the underlying data stores, you've got potentially users plumbing the data into those tools and not really understand what they're doing and how to do it. And so there's a, a control element that can be challenging where, you know, we're, we're trying to enable self-service or whatever. Um, but in doing so, uh, you might lose control uh, from a data governance and definition perspective and have a whole bunch of different answers to the same question floating out there. Um, so I think that's also one of the challenges that are introduced. So it, it's trying to find that middle ground of, can you have the right number of people that actually understand how to really use the tool and configure the tool, serve the people that are actually going to be um, using the, the, these tools on a day-to-day -day basis to try and keep the appropriate level of control on top of the data and also help facilitate using the tools to their maximum um, ability. And then on top of it, managing the change of getting people to even use them in the first place. So that's my perspective. Yeah, as Ken said, I'll touch on end user. Um, you know, the irony of the end user experience with all these tools out there is that these tools have gotten so much easier to use. Um, but the problem with that is there's so many more of these tools put in front of each end user, right? So it's, um, you know, 
one day someone's dropping something in front of you in Power BI, the next day it's Tableau. Um, you know, so sort of your real decision makers in organization, your people that don't have time to learn these tools that just need to consume the decision and help drive the business, they just don't got time to learn all of these different tools. So, I mean, it, it becomes a, an exercise of, of working with these organizations to make sure that we aren't, you know, going rogue on them, you know, and just putting out what's, you know, what's easiest or, or what, you know, what fits in their organization is a very, very important part of this from a support perspective, from a knowledge management perspective, um, from a usability perspective, right? So I think it's, it, it, it often goes unstated or unthought about, but you know, how does the solution that you're going to deliver really fit in the landscape of that organization? Um, and, you know, it, it's something that, that needs to be thought about early and often when you're delivering these types of projects. Yeah, that's a, that, those are some very good ideas and, and points about these tools. And, and I think that I have a tendency, and, and I'm sure others do as well, but I have a tendency to take for granted a comfort level with all these different tools because I can see how they're more similar than different in certain ways or how one works like another one that has worked like, but this is my profession. I'm supposed to do this. This is not the fundamental you know, job that most people have. Like this is a, a small part of what they're doing in their career is, is being able to access information, learn about what's going on and then a, deploy that knowledge in a way that will help their, their business thrive. And, and they don't have the luxury of time in many cases to learn the ins and outs of these tools to, um, you know, to, to, to figure out, you know, slightly better ways to, you know, analyze a piece of information. They, ju they just need to get to the answer. The, the fundamental nature of the answers that they need hasn't materially changed um, you know, over the last 10 years. It, it's just some of the tool sets have, have evolved and evolved quickly. Um, so, so those are some, some very good points. What, what yeah. I, 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 I kind of want to go, go ahead. Yeah. The, the other thing I would add on to it is I feel like, you know, some of these organizations also getting a little more into the technical side before we change. The uh, they, uh, um, they, uh, um, sorry, Sorry. Uh, no, no. They uh, they think all these tools are the same thing, and they're not. They all work very differently. And when you start getting under the hood and having to do some of this implementation project, you start to allude to it, which made me think of it. Like, they've all come a long way. They all have some great capabilities. They all have some downsides. But like, you know, I think organizations can get oversold on the capabilities of the tool and say, "Oh no, I can do what this other tool does, or I can do what this other tool does." And that's where it comes into people who really understand how these tools work and what is required for them to work is it, extremely important. Um, they, you know, some of them, the data sitting behind the tool doesn't have to be in the greatest shape or structure and you can do some of the cleansing on the way in. Other ones, it better be in a perfect model sitting behind it. Otherwise you're not gonna get a whole heck of a lot out of it. And then there's all these features on top that, you know, depending on what they're really trying to get out of it, one tool may be an obvious choice over than another, but it's hard to, cut through that when trying to be sold on a tool. And so a lot of these organizations, to Dan's point, end up with many of these tools, <laughs> you know, in their arsenal, so to speak, which causes operational issues, um, administrative nightmares, um, it, you know, not to mention where Dan was going is, which tool do I go to for what now? I don't understand. Like, I'm just trying to get an answer to my question. So I think that that's at the root of it is, you know, some of them are better, better at other things and, and when evaluating them kind of in silos, organizational silos, you end up with a, a bunch of them laying around and it's hard to navigate that environment. That um, that brings up a, a thought I've been thinking about a lot lately around the topic of enterprise architecture. And I've, I've observed, and I'm curious if you guys have as well, um, enterprise architecture is kind of dead in a lot of organizations. Like they, there's no rhyme or reason at the enterprise level of, of why certain decisions get made. They, they, they've stopped trying to coordinate what's best for an organization through the traditional enterprise architecture um, you know, function. It, it's kind of just the Wild West. People, people will be so frustrated with the tools that their centralized IT organization provides them that they will literally whip out the credit card and go buy some cloud services and risk the slap on the wrist that they may face because it's so important to them to be able to get something done. Have, have you seen that? Do you, do you agree? Like is enterprise architecture dead or is it just struggling um, in organizations today? 
I mean, from my perspective, I think it's, it's a question of, you know, is it up to the current standard? Maybe, I don't know what the right term is. Is it current is a challenge that often exists. There, there's these infrastructures uh, and architectures that exist that um, have been around for a long time and maybe just aren't serving the needs of the business anymore. Um, in, in that vein, it, it's a big investment to get, get them to where they need to be and to be a little bit more, more nimble from a, a, a call just from an infrastructure perspective. At the same time, partially tooling, partially just organizationally, there, there's just a lot of red tape, there's a lot of uh, companies and it, it's more a nimbleness and an agility thing than it is anything to do with anything else, right? It's, I want to do this, I want to do it now. Well, okay, well, it's going to take six months. Well, if I go and just take out my credit card, like you said, and, and buy this thing, they say they'll do it for me in a couple of weeks, you know? Um, and, and so it's, that makes it a very challenging environment. Um, I think when it comes down to it, you know, where, where does the money come from in most organizations? It comes from the business and that's where the funding originates. And, it, and IT is there as a, generally a service provider to provide certain services. And when those services aren't provided, the money gets allocated elsewhere. Um, now, that all said, I'm a big proponent of trying to have some sort of centralized architecture and control over the stuff for reasons we've stated earlier, so that you have some visibility into what's being used, how it's being used, and control over that, right? So that you aren't defining something as rudimentary as revenue differently when group one is using it versus group two, for maybe very good reasons, but um, when it makes it to the same executive, they, you know, don't understand what they're looking at anymore. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know that it's dead necessarily. I think just in a lot of places, it's it's not where it needs to be. So, oftentimes, you know, certain business units look elsewhere to try and satisfy their requirements. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and uh, let, let me just the only the only thing I want to add to that though is like, not not that you were implying this, but is enterprise architecture bad? Like that that implies that there's there's a, a fault on the side of the IT. You know, when I hear that question, and, and it may not be what you implied, but I mean, I think there's also that same fault on the, the side of business owners, right? They see these bright, shiny objects that they can go out and solve their immediate problem with, but they don't think of the overall impact it can have on the organization. Um, you know, when you set this up, who's going to support it? You know, what is the licensing structure like? You know, are we getting, you know, the, the proper licensing deals when you have four different organizations going and buying these various tools and in, in small pockets, right? Do you have the proper support structure set up, right? Um, you know, there's a whole whole list of things that, that needs to be thought through and collaborated between business and IT on this. And I think, you know, where I've seen the biggest challenges is that that collaboration just starts to break down. You have, you know, business owners, you know, as you mentioned, just going out and saying, that's very shiny and very quick and the dog and pony show I saw, you know, was amazing. They tell me I don't need IT, right? Mm -hmm. They tell me, you know, they tell you that because they want you to buy it, right? Um, you do need IT. You know, you need, you need IT to support. You need IT to own the data. You need IT to own the governance. You know, there's a, there's a lot of it behind it. Um, so when these organizations that do this right and they're having these conversations about, you know, what should we buy? Why should we buy? But are also having these conversations often enough so their technology is really servicing the business, as Ken went into. You know, that, that's where it's done properly. So I wouldn't say it's dead. I'd say it's gotten a lot more complex and um, organizational processes around supporting the enterprise architecture haven't matured as quickly as the technology has. Yeah, I think those are fair points. And I certainly wasn't trying to imply uh, blame on any particular group. I think that it's a, it's a reasonable thing that the vendors have learned, to Ken's point, uh, the business side of the organization is where the money is. And so they're going to try to sell it to the business and they're going to try to get the business to pull it along because it seems to be a more viable sales strategy for those vendors. And, and maybe that's the way it should be. I, I find it interesting though, that, that enterprise architecture has struggled to, to rein it back in at this point. And I think it's something that we'll want to be um, cognizant of as we can, you know, as we see continued proliferation of a bunch of different options in organizations and, and they're just buying everything they have one of each and and then they don't talk nice and then it's hard to get the right skills and then you know it it, it keeps you know us consultants busy because we're trying to navigate a lot of this but it, it isn't always the best solution for um the the organizations themselves and and it's and it's largely self you know 
self uh, created on their side. We come in and try to, to fix it. Um, but I, I, I just it's one more dynamic um, that makes the data environment in which we're trying to create these change and transformation projects. Um, you know, it makes it that much more difficult to, to be successful in um, while we still have a little bit of time. I want to talk to you guys about, you know, the, the nature of work today. Now, this we're recording this a few months into the COVID-19 pandemic, where most organizations are still very heavily in a work remote type of situation. And we've seen, you know, it, you know even prior to this, a move towards uh, more decentralized teams, more work from home, more um, you're just spread out people um, and, and managing projects and, and transformation programs in this kind of environment presents some unique challenges. And so um, can you guys talk about what you've seen, how that's evolved and, and advice you may have for folks that are trying to run projects with you know decentralized workforces, sometimes never even going to the office at all? Yeah, I'll start. I think one of the things that's come that I've seen from the pandemic is people are starting to realize that it, it's not impossible, right? It, it is. There's a lot of opportunity, and you can, you know, almost get more out of your people when they can be around to put their kids on the bus and they can be home to get their kids off the bus and then really get into focusing on work. You know, yeah. um, people people produce the most for organizations when they're feeling like they're whole, right? And I think, you know, when you have to kind of leave a part of that to get to your office early in the morning and then leave, and again, it doesn't have to be every day, but there's a lot you can do from home. You can do just about everything that you need to from home, right? Um, a lot of where some of the projects I was working on before I leave, you know, I would go into the office and I wouldn't see a whole lot of the people that I was working with. I would be in the office to make sure that people knew I was there as a consultant, right? I mean, it, it is the base time as a consultant is very important to me, um, whether or not it's good for my clients anymore, I'm not as sure of, right? But mm -hmm. um, I, I think the tools that are provided are have grown tremendously, you know, between your WebExes and your Zooms and, you know, all of those types of things, the ability to share on Teams and, and all those other tools is, you know, it is pretty amazing at this point. Plus that, you know, that work-life balance. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity to evolve, right? Um, as organizations of, of what does work from home look like um that being said like there is something to the teaming to the building of the relationships to the you know really understanding what makes an individual tick that you start to lose when you do everything remotely right so um what's that balance you know i mean i think one of the things that a lot of these organizations are gonna large organizations are gonna have to to focus on now is what does the office of the future look like right i mean uh, you know i mean i think in the past, space was getting smaller. You know, people's individual space was getting smaller. And now, all of a sudden, if you need to, you know, increase the amount of individual space for safety reasons, you know, it kind of starts to change things as well. So, you know, the tooling has been amazing in, in making sure that projects continue to go, continue to be successful. Communications are, are you know, open, honest. And you can see, not only hear what people are saying, but see how they're saying it. I mean, um, so I think there's a tremendous opportunity for organizations to really figure out um, how to, to leverage these technologies, what makes sense for their people, what makes sense for their projects, what makes sense for their office spend, right? A lot of these companies have a lot of people going into the office that may not need to. Do they need that much space, right? So um, it's going to be an interesting time over the next, you know, six to 12 months to watch what organizations do um, as it relates to work from home, as it relates to being in the office, as it relates to productivity measurements and those types of things. Makes sense. Yeah, no. I'll just add, I think from a challenges perspective, from, from what I'm seeing, you know, Dan mentioned a lot of good things that are coming of this. And I think the areas where I still see, you know, a couple of challenges are, you know, trying to reproduce that whiteboarding type environment. I understand some of these tools have that capability. It's just, it's not the same, at least in my opinion, maybe not yet. Maybe it's going to take some time uh, to kind of have that in-person interaction I'm up drawing something up. Now someone else is up drawing something up, crossing out some things, whatever. I, I think that's still been a bit of a challenge as well as, you know, the maybe some pros and cons, but the water cooler conversation, right? Where sometimes that's an ad hoc conversation. Hey, I was thinking about this. What do you think about that? Like that type of stuff. Now that's kind of moved a little bit more over chat, which it's just not as fluid of a dialogue um, 
anymore. But in, I, I call it a, a pro and a con because maybe the, the pro of it is that sometimes those aren't always the most productive conversations either. Um, so I think those have been the, some of the challenges. But as far as like ongoing management of existing projects that we have, it, it's it's the same stuff, right? It's providing periodic status, you know, depending on how the project's being run, daily check-ins, weekly check-ins, that type of stuff. Making sure that people are aware if you're hitting roadblocks and you know what some of those action steps are to try and eliminate those roadblocks. Those things can be done, I think, as effectively remotely as they can be you know, were you sitting in the same office? And, and on top of all of that, Dan touched on it, you know, not only on our current clients, but on many of our previous clients, um, there's a lot of big organizations already have distributed workforces, so you're not already co-located with everyone in your office, right? So like a lot of organizations already had to start, start to scratch the surface on that. Now, I think the challenge is that organizations that never had to do that before are being forced to do it. But they're benefiting from some of the tools and capabilities that have been built over built up over time for the organizations that had to operate in that fashion at least in some some way uh, i think it's extreme for everyone at this point but um not as huge of an adjustment for some of the organizations that we've worked with in the past yeah that that makes good sense well we're, we're just about out of time um any last parting words any last bit of advice for for folks and and you know, how they should approach data projects and, and data transformation efforts or anything else that um, you think would be worthwhile in, in terms of the, the you know, working during the pandemic or, or just, you know, how do, you know, here's one, here, one question to end with. How does a client make the most of their consulting relationship? How do, how, what does a client need to do to get the most bang for the buck in working with a consultant? I'll go ahead and start. I, I think the the most bang for the buck is to realize that it is a partnership, right? And, you know, there are certain scenarios where you can hand stuff over to us and we can deliver it, but it works best when we're working together, um, you know, where those dialogues are open, where those meetings are happening, where those checkpoints are in place, where, um, you know, whether it's in person, whether it's at the office or whether it's in the pandemic scenario where you've got to be on Zoom, but that you're having those touch points where, uh, the business owners understand the evolution of the project and the changes and the, the wins and the losses that are occurring on a daily basis. Um, you know, we can come in, the biggest misses that we can have is when we come in and someone expects us just to, to take the entire project and deliver, you know, we'll tell you upfront what we need, um, you know, from a supportive perspective, from a collaboration perspective, from a SME perspective to be successful. Um, but if, if those SMEs aren't invested, it just doesn't work. So when we have a true partnership, um, you know, and I know you had mentioned earlier that we had worked together, the project that we worked together, we had some wonderful partners and, you know, some, you know, very deep meetings. And, you know, it, there were some certainly struggles and challenges on the project, um, but we worked through them because we felt like a team, right? Even though we were coming from a variety of different consultancies um, and then the clients. Um, you know, we had the right structure, the right people in place. We had the right um, business SMEs helping ask the questions and the right consultants providing guidance on what the answers were. So I think that partnership um, can often get lost and says when companies believe that, yeah, let's hire a consultant, bring them in and they'll solve the problem. And I, problems will get solved. It just, are they the right problems that are being solved? Yeah. Yeah. The, the add on or that I would, I would put to that is um, I feel like, the partnership stuff is, is very critical, but it's also about having the right mentality on, especially data projects, which is, you know, it, it's not that we're gonna run a project forever. It's about how do we incrementally deliver value, like Dan mentioned, along the way in the spirit of trying to achieve some sort of vision. And that, guess what, even when we're there and, and hopefully handing it off to internal teams to carry forward, whatever the case may be, it's never done. Right, there's always going to be an evolution, especially in the data space. We're not talking about, okay, we want to put a button on this web page, and when you click that button, it does this thing. We're talking, okay, well, we think we solve this problem, but through that, we realized that we had these five more questions, right? How do we go about solving those questions? Those questions lead to more questions. And so um, that is actually how these projects are supposed to work. And, you know, I think that's in the spirit of partnership, that's the type of approach that we bring to the table when we, when we first engage. Great. 
Well, Ken, Dan, thank you both for being here today. I really appreciate it. And thank you for watching or listening today. You'll find links and more information about today's topic in the show notes. Please remember to subscribe to our show on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Visit algman.com to learn more about Algman Data Leadership and the many ways we can help you become a data leader. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact. Thank <laughs> you.